Hi, hello, and welcome again to another unscripted video of Natural Juan. And when I say unscripted, that means I'm doing this on the fly. I mean, I'll be making a lot of mistakes, again, as usual, when it comes to unscripted videos, so please bear with me. Anyway, if you've enjoyed my content so far, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications. Now, <clears throat> This video will be the first among my book review videos wherein I'll be reviewing the various rule books of various games. And this time, as you can see right in front of you, I'm going to be reviewing the Pathfinder First Edition role playing game, the core rule book, because we have to start somewhere, right? So this is their core rule book, and this was their first foray. This was Paizo, you know, the company that made Pathfinder. This is their first foray into the tabletop. Well, maybe not the first. Okay, I'll give you a short history. I mentioned before that there was some history between Pathfinder, Paizo, and uh, Dungeons and & Dragons. So, okay, to start with, Dungeons & Dragons... Actually, so, <laughs> all right, all right. Dungeons and Dragons, before, the Paizo used to be a part of that. They used to be part of the Dungeons and Dragons team that made Dungeons and Dragons 3.5, perhaps the most popular edition of Dungeons and Dragons. But what happened was, as they moved on to fourth edition, a lot of people were unhappy with the changes. And so Paizo, the people behind Pathfinder, they said, oh, we're going to start our own thing. So yeah. And the thing is, with Dungeons and Dragons, they have their... I'm going to show you right here. Where is that? Where is that? Okay, here we are. So you can see they're talking about open content as you can read here yeah they have an open game license open game license that was originally made by Gary Gygax the guy who came up with Dungeons and Dragons so he's actually giving people other people permission to use the system he created so they can create their own games and this is what Pathfinder built off of they took the system that came out with Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 and they started their own. This is how they created Pathfinder because of creative differences with Dungeons and Dragons. Now I heard that after the criticism uh, Dungeons and Dragons received, they came up with their, they finally came out with 5th edition which I hear is better. and. But I've never tried it. I've never tried Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition or 4th edition. And to be honest, okay, here's one more thing while we're at it. I'm not the only I'm not the only guy with the name Natural Juan out there. There is another Natural Juan and they are a community of Dungeons & Dragons players. And sad to say, I don't think I'll be covering Dungeons & Dragons anytime soon and I'll strictly be sticking to Pathfinder so to avoid confusion between me and them. I think they're Filipinos too but I'm not sure so yeah I'm just do so I'll be covering Pathfinder. I might cover Dungeons & Dragons someday but that won't be soon. Okay so I think I've given you a long enough intro let's get started. So this is Pathfinder and it is almost completely identical to Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 to the point that it's actually called Dungeons & Dragons 3.7 by some people because it's the rules are just so close to that they use the same d20 system and they pretty much run on the same rules now let's see what's in this book so getting started as I said the Dungeons & Dragon I mean the Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 is extremely similar to Pathfinder 1st Edition. And you can see that in the way they have ability scores. This is the first thing that you'll need if you want to create a character for Pathfinder. So, for those who aren't familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, your six abilities are Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, and those three comprise your physical abilities or physical attributes 
anyway, the reason I'm doing this unscripted because I can show you the book. You can see the content right here. Now, if I did it scripted, you just get a bunch of pictures and I don't think I'd be able to capture everything the way it should be. So that's why I'm doing this freestyle. Then you have your mental attributes or mental abilities, which include intelligence. That's how smart your character is, at least when it comes to books, wisdom and charisma. Now, you might want to ask what makes all these different. So I'll give you guys an example. I mean, at least for those who aren't familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, although it's very unlikely that you're unfamiliar with it if you're watching this video. If you're a newbie, and maybe just one of my followers who joined me off Facebook, well, here's the explanation. Strength is your character's strength, obviously. This is what lets you use, you know, big swords and stuff like that. And strength also adds to the damage you do with melee weapons like swords and axes strength also determines how much stuff you can carry because you know if you're a weak guy how can you expect to carry so much N next is dexterity this is just your this is like your speed and stuff like that how fast you can move and dexterity governs how you can use ranged attacks like bows and guns and also it determines how well you can dodge an attack, that's why it's also included in armor class. I'll be explaining that in a bit. And it also governs your initiative, like how soon can your character act when a battle begins. Like if he's got very high dexterity, it's likely that he's gonna go first, right? Anyway, this armor class, this describes the overall defense of your character. So this includes your character's armor and how fast he can dodge stuff. To be honest, okay, I'm gonna drop an unpopular opinion right now. I was never a fan of the armor class system. I don't know, it's just not realistic to me. That's why I choose Pathfinder's variant rules such as armor as damage reduction. But I'll be getting to that in another video. I'm not going to cover that here because it's too complicated. Just know that armor class is your overall defense. This is how good your character is at avoiding damage instead of just taking it. Constitution is your character's health, overall health. This governs how healthy they are, how many hit points, like how many times they can get hit by an attack and survive and how they can resist stuff like poison and disease intelligence like i said this is how intelligent your character is academically how good he he or she is with books and stuff like that next is wisdom wisdom is different from intelligence in that wisdom is more experience based so your character is wise if he knows his way around the city i mean you can or the way he talks to people like he knows if he or she knows if someone is lying to him to them they can find out oh uh, this guy's body language is all wrong he he or she must be lying to me so that's how wisdom works it's not something you can study for it's just something you learn along the way charisma this is your leadership and will skill it also represents how beautiful or handsome your character is so Technically, if you have uh, a charisma score of 18, that means your character is drop-dead gorgeous or he's he or she is just that commanding. Like, you know, some people, they might not be great-looking people. They might not be that handsome or beautiful. But nonetheless, when they tell you to do something, you really want to do it. That's, how, that's what charisma is about. Now, let's move on to the other aspect of this game, races. Like, yeah, it's also almost completely similar to Dungeons & Dragons because you have the same races as you did there. And no, this doesn't refer to people's skin color, although they might apply to orcs. It's more or less people who are other than human. So yes, you have your dwarf, your halfling, your elf, your garden variety human, your gnome, your half-orc, and half elf just to explain in case you already know what a dwarf and an elf is i mean there's enough lord of the rings movies and their imitators out there so you know what these are, most some of these are but a halfling 
is a hobbit. Uh, another history trivia, Dungeons and Dragons actually tried to use the word hobbit before until uh, the company governing J.R.R. Tolkien, the writer of Lord of the Rings, they they uh, I think they charged a lawsuit against Dungeons and Dragons at the time, so they had to change the name from Hobbit to Halfling. And yes, Halfling is actually used as a nickname for Hobbits in Lord of the Rings, and since it's different from Hobbit, uh, I guess Tolkien's estate let them use it. Now, for the next one, gnomes. Uh, these are little people too, just like dwarves and halflings, but the difference is Gnomes tend to be a little smarter and a little crazier. That's the same they are as in Dungeons and & Dragons and World of Warcraft. The only thing that sets the gnomes of Pathfinder apart from the gnomes of other franchises like Dungeons and & Dragons and World of Warcraft, the gnomes of Pathfinder are part fey or part fairy. They, they originally came from another dimension. So basically, they're fairies who are a little bit more relatable to humans. I, yeah, and the thing is, in this particular game, if gnomes get bored, it's very dangerous for them to get bored in this game because if they get too bored, they have what they call bleaching and they turn all white and it's like part of their soul dies. Another thing I have to inform you about is the elves of Pathfinder are also different from other franchises in that in Pathfinder they're actually aliens. Yes, they're aliens. They're more like the Vulcans of Star Trek than they are uh, the elves by token. Anyway, then you have half-orc, you know, people who are a mix of orc and human and half-elf. Humans who, I mean, people who are half human and half elf. So, uh, I'll go more into half orcs in another video, but the thing about half orcs is that there's always a stigma against them because they're considered monsters. Well, just like they are in Lord of the Rings, you know, they say orcs, they tend to be monstrous and all that. The same thing, the same stereotype exists in Pathfinder and a lot of the evil races, they're a little bit worse in this franchise. Okay, next we move on to classes, and the same classes from Dungeons & Dragons are still the same, in that you have Bard, have your Halfling Bard, you got your Cleric, you know the Priest, for those not in the know, your bard is your musician or traveling entertainer. They can be musicians or dancers or singers. Your cleric is your priest or priestess. You can see her right here. Druid. Uh, druid is a kind of magician that focuses more on nature magic. See see there, Druid here has a pet leopard. That's, that's because she ha shares a magical connection with this leopard here. <coughs> They're the kind of magicians that can make the grass grow faster or they can make vines attack people and yes, they can make animals attack you. Next, you have your fighter. This is one of the most common classes in most D20 games, I guess except maybe mutants and masterminds. But yeah, the fighter is your fighting man. He's the basic warrior uh, pathfinder. Then you have the monk. You know, they're the people who are who are usually practicing martial arts and there's a religious bend to what they do. You have your paladin, you know, the stereotypical white knight who fights for justice and righteousness. You have the ranger. These are like for those not in the know, okay, I'm just I'm talking to the non the newbies, the non tabletop role player people. They're like Legolas and Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, you know, they live in the they stay in the forest They're skilled with ranged combat just like this dwarf here This is a rarity because most dwarves tend to be you know warriors or something like that But this dwarf see he's got a crossbow and He's good at tracking Next is your rogue 
For those not in the know who are completely unfamiliar with role-playing games, rogues are your criminals. There's no better way to put it. Rogues are war are warriors who they're part of the criminal element. They they can be doing a lot of things like you know stealing stuff, con uh, doing assassinations, stuff like that. So next you have your sorcerer and wizard, your magician. So this is their sorcerer, Sioni. And then you have your wizard, Ezrin. Now, you might be wondering, since sorcerer and wizard, they sound very similar. I mean, they're both magicians. Again, I'm talking to the non-tabletop role-playing community out there in case the people who aren't familiar with this kind of thing. The difference between a sorcerer and a wizard is that a sorcerer is born with their powers. They are people who are naturally good at a certain kind of magic. That doesn't mean they're good at all kinds of magic. In fact, the kind of magic they have is limited. They can only use one type of magic. <coughs> so, but they're good at that magic. Your wizard, however, is the kind of person who or is a kind of magician who studies all kinds of magic and are good with just about any kind of magic, be it, you know, controlling the elements or creating illusions to fool people. They're good at just about all of them, but here's the best way to put it. Your wizard is your jack of all trades, but master of none. They're the people who have talents that they've actually developed over time. Your sorcerer, on the other hand, is a person with an inborn talent. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. They have an inborn talent, and they, they're very specialized with it, but they can use their talents more freely like they can just have it like I want to create a fireball right now so they can do that the wizard is kind of limited in that way because he can only cast so many spells but at least he knows a lot of spells a sorcerer might not have a lot of spells but they can call theirs up more often that's like the difference between someone that just learns a talent or trains to gain a talent compared to a person who is born with a talent like someone who is naturally gifted next we have your skills so skills here are pretty much the same as dungeons and dragons but they combined a lot of the skills that are found there for example the in dungeons and dragons as far as i know they have uh, spot, listen, and smell. I don't know if they have a touch check. I don't really remember. But yeah, they have spot check, listen checks, and smell checks. But in this game, they're all combined into perception. That makes it easier so they can, so that you don't have to roll if they sense something or not. However, for, uh, for players that want a little more realism, I guess this kind of falls flat because perception is everything. Like, uh, I mean, you don't, you can only see with your eyes, you can only hear with your ears. So I guess there's that, there's that difference between them. Next, you have feats. This is another holdover from Dungeons and & Dragons. And this is one of the complaints of this game is that this game is too... There's just too many feats in this game. That's what people usually complain about. There's too many feats. So you already have the feats from original Dungeons & Dragons here, but in later books, I'm going to show you that they have a lot more feats. A lot more. So, yeah. There's stuff like that in this game that you just need to watch out for. So, combat... For those not in the know or how things are done overall just so you know i need to tell you guys how all this works so this is just for those people who aren't familiar 
with how things work in this game or not familiar with tabletop role-playing games so Pathfinder runs on the D20 system created by Gary Gygax and so it involves rolling uh, D20 dice a 20 sided dice wait let me show you what it looks like yeah this is a D20 so basically what happens is so for example you have see their DC modifier so for example you're going to make a high jump and I'm you're gonna use your acrobatics check so what's going to happen is I'm going to try to jump 12 feet suppose I have a bonus 4 feet that gives me bonus 4 I need to roll a number that's higher than 12 so I have if I have a bonus of 4 ah, where'd that go yeah 11 so I get a 16 because I have 4 Oh, 15, 15. Sorry, I'm very bad at math. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. I get a 15 that's higher than 12. That means I succeed. But if I, got, if I got a number that is actually lower, that means I would have failed. And another thing I'll have to tell you is that in this game, <clears throat> or in all D20 system, there's what they call natural 20, natural 1. So depending on your game master, if they're particularly cruel, or you're particularly generous it all depends on that if whenever you roll a D, uh, natural 20 it's not just a success it's a huge success for example you try to if your character makes a perception check and they make a natural 20 that means they Im they see everything nothing is hidden to them because they rolled so well that's how the nat 20 works but if they roll a nat 1 they can't see a thing. Nat 1, natural 1 is a very bad result. And natural 1s and 20s are especially significant during battle. And like I said, it depends on how cruel or generous your game master is. Like, you can say that when you roll... Now, usually, usually, okay? When you roll a natural 20 in combat, that means you double your damage. That's not always the case. Sometimes you can triple or quadruple your damage. But in Pathfinder, usually you double your damage. When doing Nat 1, I don't... There's the condition cards. Maybe I'll get to show you guys that sometime. But maybe you, fu you make a big mistake with how you handle your weapon. It can mean, for example, your sword, your sword gets caught in a tree or... You mistakenly drop your sword or maybe even you slip on a banana peel and fall on your face that sort of thing yeah that's how that works and once your hit points are reduced to zero in this game at least you die it's the way yeah that's how d20 systems work although i would say another d20 game would be mutants and mastermind that's a little different but i'll go over that some other time so that pretty much sums up this review of Pathfinder and like I said it is really almost identical with Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 just with a few more rules and uh, see even the spells the spells let me show you the spells first before we completely finish up so a lot of the spells in this game are still pretty much the same they're still pretty much the same 3.5 spells there's just a few more there's just a few differences they added a few a little bit more paizo added a little bit more but still pretty much the same and yeah there's really no big difference between pathfinder and dungeons and dragons 3.5 in later books i'm going I'm going to show you that they have a few more rules about a few things and another big difference is Pathfinder tends to be heavier on math like if you get I know that in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition uh, you just have what they call roll with adva advantage where you roll two 20 sided dice and 
and you just take the higher roll that's pretty much how it works but here every bonus is usually a plus two a plus five or a number and you have to add that so you can increase your chances of success that's how this game works in fact it is so bad in some places that people tend to call it math finder because of how how many how much math you'll be doing in this game so that's it for this episode this uh unscripted video of natural one i really hope i didn't make too many mistakes and end up confusing you i'm really sorry if i am confusing you because I, i'm not using a script so anyway i hope you really enjoyed this and if you did please feel free to like and share and if you want more stuff like this subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications so i'll see you guys in the next video see ya